Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and today's guest is Dr. Jennifer Heis. Dr. Jennifer Heis is an expert on brain health. She's an associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology at McMaster University and directs a NeuroFit lab, which has attracted nearly $1 million to support her research program on the effects of exercise for brain health. Dr. Heis received her PhD in cognitive neuroscience and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in brain health and aging at the Rotman Research Institute at Baycrest Hospital in Toronto. Her research examines the effects of physical activity on brain function to promote mental health and cognition in young adults, older adults, and individuals with Alzheimer's disease. So let's get this conversation going and welcome Dr. Jennifer Heis to the Adversity Advantage podcast. Jennifer, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to, to talk to you. This is like right up my alley when we're talking about exercise and how it impacts our brain, how it impacts our mental health, how it helps people for, recover from addiction, how it helps prevent people from experiencing mental health issues and getting addicted to drugs. So I'm really looking forward to this. I guess a good place for us to start is like, why do you think like exercise is so hard for people to stick to and for people to get involved with, despite the fact that we know how great it is for our health? Well, yeah. So I think there's probably two things, right? So the first, and both have to do with the brain. So the first one is related to our brain's desire to conserve energy. So essentially the brain makes us lazy. And this is a relic of our evolutionary past. So when we had to expend a lot of energy to hunt and gather our food, the brain wanted to conserve energy when it didn't need to expend it for survival purposes. And so flash forward to now in modern day, do we really have to move to survive? Not really. I mean, to be sure, it's best for health and survival in the long run. But, you know, like our prehistoric humans, we didn't have to, you know, we don't have to evade predators or run for our food. And so the brain is trying to conserve energy and wants to make us stay still. And so when we want to expend energy for exercise, for example, the brain's like, it's protesting. Do you really want to spend that energy? Aren't you too tired? Do we even have time? It'd rather you just sit there and, you know, watch TV or listen to a podcast or something. <laughs> the other reason why exercise is so hard is it's stressful. I mean, it's hard work. It's actually a physical stressor on the body. And the body and the brain would prefer to stay in homeostasis, so at this homeostatic set point. And so it, it tries to prevent you from doing that. So you have these sort of two things against you, the energy conservation, the brain wants that lazy brain, but also this avoiding of stressful things that the brain would rather have you do. Right. That makes a lot of sense because like, obviously a lot has changed uh, biologically and physiologically for humans as we've evolved and we don't like necessarily need the same amount of energy that we once did because we're not out hunting or running away from a saber tooth tiger or whatever <laughs> exactly. other um, things we were doing like back in the day. But I think one of the things that is really interesting to me about your work is that we hear so much about how exercise is good specifically for the brain and you get this endorphin rush and it's good to help with anxiety, depression, like all the things. But if you could maybe paint a picture in, in the simplest way you can of like what goes on neurologically when we exercise and why it's actually so beneficial for our brains. Mm -hmm. Well, there's so much that goes on. This is really the amazing thing. And endorphins are just one piece of that puzzle. So yes, endorphins are released when we exercise, especially when we exercise hard, because endorphins are the body's natural painkiller, and it helps relieve like aching muscles as we move. But there's so many other things that are released. So one thing released is endocannabinoids, which is the body's natural production of cannabis. And it's Essentially, this goes right to the reward center of the brain and causes the release of dopamine to make us feel good and have that rewarding pleasure sense. And that's the same exact same system that's stimulated by drugs of abuse. But the great thing about exercise is it, it stimulates it just enough, not too much so that it's healthy and helpful for the brain. Other things the brain releases, this is one of my favorite factors, is neuropeptide Y. And this is the resiliency factor of the brain. So 
People who experience traumatic events who have more of neuropeptide Y are less likely to get post-traumatic stress disorder. And we can build more neuropeptide Y with exercise. And it doesn't have to be intense exercise. This one you get with just light or moderate exercise. And so that's a way that soothes the anxious brain, soothes the region in the brain called the amygdala, which is really our, our fear center. And so, yeah, there's so many things. It increases oxygenated blood flow to the prefrontal cortex. It tells us focus and stay creative. It just really is a, it's an amazing thing that exercise does for the brain. Absolutely. And I've, I've noticed it obviously in my own life, like fitness literally saved my life from the depths of addiction. It saved my life from some severe mental health stuff I was battling. And it's helped me not only build a business, but use that business of personal training and the podcast to, to help other people along the way. You mentioned like dopamine, you talked about drugs and dopamine and you hear a lot about the runner's high and how like when you start to exercise or you start to go for a run, like you start to feel similar, like a similar euphoric feeling to being on drugs. If you could maybe help explain like what specific drugs do to the brain as far as our dopamine receptors and then talk about how that compares to the runner's high, how that compares to getting a good workout in. Yeah, so it's amazing to hear your story. And there are so many beautiful stories about the help with recovery that exercise gives. And this, I think, is one of the best gifts it gives is it helps it helps the brain recover from addiction. It speeds up that painful, painful process, right, of, of getting your life back. So the way that exercise, okay, so I'll start with drugs. The way that drugs work in the brain. So all drugs of abuse, alcohol, stimulate dopamine production. And dopamine is this rewarding neurochemical, feel-good neurochemical. And it's released by natural things like food, sex, and exercise. But the thing with drugs of abuse is that it increases dopamine to supernatural levels. So with, for example, methamphetamine, it's, it increases it to 1,100 times above baseline compared to exercise, which is only 130 times. And so we're talking like super, so this is why it's so addictive. And then what the problem is, so it floods the brain with all this dopamine, but the brain needs to maintain sort of a balance. It's too much. It was never meant to deal with that much dopamine. And so what happens is the brain essentially locks down the reward system. So it strips away its receptors. The drug needs to bind to, to stimulate dopamine. But the consequence of this is that stripping away those receptors means that natural things in life no longer give you pleasure. And the longer you use, the more you use, the more the reward system locks down, the more of those receptors are stripped, which creates this tolerance where you need more and more of the drug to feel that same level of high. And so, sorry if this is painful to talk about. I would probably, I mean, no, no, no. I'm, even I, I, I even just about hearing about this is, you know, it can trigger. Uh, it can trigger, and and this is the thing with addiction in the brain. It's it just, it's, it's. You know, you, your brain can recover, but the, the cues and the triggers are always make you a little bit vulnerable, right? So, so the really great thing about exercise is it helps speed up recovery. So by the miraculous thing about the brain is that it heals, you know, no matter, no, no need for guilt or shame, just, you know, let's move forward. This idea that, you know, once you stop using, the reward system starts gradually reopening so that you can start enjoying life again. But it does take time. It takes, it can take a lot of time. And th the great thing about exercise is it speeds it up. So not only does exercise provide the reward system with the dopamine that it craves, so it can crush cravings, but it also helps reopen and replenish the receptors that we need to stimulate reward. So it's just this really incredible thing. In my book, I talk about how it should be mandatory for all you know, re recovery rehab centers to have this. I think the one of the greatest sources of strength and support when somebody returns home is are these running or exercise groups where where there's so much social support, but there's also this neurological support in the form of exercise induced dopamine. Yeah, I love how you brought all that up because 
I think that there's this this neurological change from my own personal experience that happens when you abuse drugs for such a period of time. And I think we need to, like when we get into recovery, you need to include things in your life that'll help bring your brain back to some level of homeostasis. And I think obviously exercise is a major factor in that along with other things. And I also think that having it as a staple in recovery programs is, would be awesome. That's something that I've been advocating for for years because I saw the impact it had in my life. And then I started to train other people in recovery and I saw the impact it had in their lives. And I'm like, wait a second, like, why isn't this like a fundamental piece of treatment and recovery? It should be. I 100% agree. Mm hmm. I want to talk about cravings because I found, I found when I was reading your book, which by the way, your book is called Move the Body, Heal the Mind. Move the Body, Heal the Mind. Yeah, yeah I got it right. Yeah, Move the Body, <laughs> yeah, Move the Body, Heal the Mind. And it talked about the importance of doing like vigorous exercise, doing something challenging when you're experiencing a craving. Like, why is this so important? Yeah, so uh, the exercise is stimulates this release of dopamine. So you exercise intensely, increases dopamine, and helps reduce cravings. It's really, really fascinating. And one study showed that moderate to vigorous cycling, jogging, brisk walking is enough to crush cravings for 30 minutes afterwards. And so it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to go for a full marathon run, but you, you know, just a 30 minute bout of exercise is enough to, to crush cravings for like, I think it was 30 minutes afterwards. Um, so, so you're getting that one hour of reprieve at least. And uh, yeah, I think that that's a, a really important tool for the, for the toolkit of recovery, right? That, that you can turn to exercise when you're, when you're feeling those cravings and get some relief. So that there's cravings are, they kind of come in two different forms. So one is really dopamine centered uh, where you're, you're craving the dopamine rush that you're used to getting and you can get that with exercise. But the other craving is related to glutamate and the cue-induced cravings. So when you see things that remind you of the drug, people that remind you of the drug, this instates this, uh, this, you know, this pathway that, that really stimulates cravings too. And exercise can help unglue that pathway, if you will, so that those cues, those triggers have less power over you. Yeah, and I think that getting sober into recovery is is challenging in itself but i think the real challenge becomes like once you've gotten some time like what do you do when a craving comes what do you do when you're like oh i really want that drink what do you do when you really want that drug or when you're having a stressful day and so knowing that they can there's a tool in their toolkit that they can use to help mitigate that again i don't think it's perfect based on what i read in your book but it looks like there was some data to support that doing a hard exercise session can reduce cravings. Talk about the different types of exercises, the different modalities of exercise based on the drugs that somebody was using and the difference between like how your workout should change if you're recovering from a less toxic drug versus one that's a little bit more dangerous. The main difference between you know, to, you know, drug intensities is that it just is going to take a little bit more time to recover. But the the idea is that all forms of exercise will be helpful. I provide a, a workout plan in my book. One of my favorite exercises that I do just to stay focused during the day is called the NeuroFix. And this is just, a, it's a short burst of high intensity exercise um, that. I think it takes like four minutes to do. It's short, you know, you can, when you're feeling cravings, you do these jumping jacks, you do the, you know, the wall, the wall climber. It, it's, it's a really cool little workout. You can do anywhere, anytime, no equipment needed, just like put it out there and uh, it'll feel good. So yeah, so I, I created the workout that has both aerobics, aerobic exercises, but also resistance exercises that based on the evidence, so they're, they're science-inspired workouts to help heal the brain from addiction. So the research shows that, I mean, aerobic exercise is really beneficial. Um, so that would be running, walking, cycling. But 
resistance exercise is also very beneficial too. And a lot of a lot of people really enjoy having the variety of exercise. So mixing it up would be, probably be really helpful combination of of different forms of exercise just to keep it novel inspiring exciting all of these aspects of an exercise program enhance the dopamine that's released by it yeah and i think it's it's really important for people to understand this from a fundamental level that in order to like recover from addiction you have to incorporate different forms of exercise into your routine and i and i cannot emphasize enough like the importance of like strength training and getting strong and just rebuilding your body rebuilding some some strength after just completely beating yourself up for years and years with drug abuse and then also like the aerobic component like getting that runner's high getting you know your levels back as far as your aerobic capacity that sort of thing i think is incredibly important talk about like the different types of of drugs and why like somebody recovering from like meth for instance is gonna have to work out harder than somebody who just was was smoking pot right so it's related to the amount of dopamine released by the drug so for example meth like i said was it increases dopamine like 1100 percent above baseline whereas other drugs of abuse may be more like 300% above baseline or 250% above baseline. It's not as much. And so what happens is that the reward system goes into more severe lockdown when you do these more intense drugs of abuse. And so to reopen it fully so that you can start really engaging with life and enjoying the simpler things in life again, it just, it's going to take more time. And so the, there needs to be this sense of patience And I I would say, you know, this is going to be a lifelong journey with exercise. And so I think a very compassionate approach is necessary. This idea that, yes, hard workouts are good, but I think perhaps a better approach, especially at the start, is like some is better than none, right? Like just having it in your life consistently, rebuilding the strength, being patient with yourself as you rebuild your strength and rebuild your brain and um, taking it really one day at a time, one step at a time. Yeah. And I think another important piece of this is you should do what feels good for you, what feels right for you, what you enjoy, because when you do things that you enjoy doing, the movement that you enjoy, you get an extra boost of dopamine. So there you have that. And then doing it with people you like to be with or having that social support really helps with not only just motivation, because motivation can be really hard, um, especially if you're feeling anxious or depressed alongside your, you know, your recovery process. That doing it together with people that, you know, your, your run club becomes like your support support system. It's your new family, right? Like, I mean, a lot of the time, you know, you're, you're rebuilding your life from scratch because all the friends and f- people that you used to associate with, you know, they're, they're not helpful anymore. And so you, you know, so you rebuild your life and you have these new exercise people that you share something in common with, and they can help you towards, you know, towards rebuilding your life. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think one of the the biggest things that happens when you commit to exercising after you recover from addiction is you get this massive improvement in your sense of self and your self-confidence. You feel so much better. You tend, like you said, just to surround yourself with a community of people that are supportive, which is everything in recovery. And you're learning, I think, in a way to deal with a lot of the things that may have led to your addiction in the prior in that stress, anxiety, depression, um, that sort of thing. I want to get into something that I, I think a lot of people have a hard time with. And that is when they're feeling overwhelmed, when they're feeling anxious, when they're feeling you know depressed, they know that exercise is good for them. I think that uh, plain and simple, I think most people would say, I know that that's true. The problem is how do you get somebody from the couch? Mm-hmm like out the door? Like, have you found in, in the science, in the literature, or even in your own work, some simple tips that somebody can adhere to when they're feeling super depressed to, to get them out the door and at least go for a walk? 
Yeah, yeah. And this is a thing. This is definitely a thing we found, especially during the pandemic, when we conducted a survey of research on 1600 people, people wanted to work out for their mental health to improve their mental health, but their mental health was sometimes getting in the way. So they were too anxious to work out. They lack the motivation, which can, is a symptom of depression. And so we offer a toolkit to help people get moving. That can be downloaded on my website, neurofitlab.com. But the basic idea is just like, you got to overcome that inertia. So how do you do that? You take a step, you know, it's a one step towards the door. You negotiate with yourself. Okay, for me, when I don't feel motivated to exercise, I negotiate. Okay, my workout, I'm supposed to be doing this intense thing, but I'm going to just, I'm going to do it. Not that intensely, but I'm going to put in the time and take off that intensity. And so... The nice thing, the amazing thing about exercise is once you start, all those neurochemicals are infused in the brain. And so it makes it easier to keep going. And so it's just overcoming that that initial inertia. And so for some people, that's like, you know, just waking up and putting on your, your workout clothes, you know, and doing it first thing in the morning before anything else happens, having your gym bag by the door, having it already packed so it's easier. For me go-to is I have to put it in my calendar. I have to block off the time. I have a coach who who puts in my workout schedule for the day. And for me, that keeps me on track. Because for me, you know, exercise, I, I use exercise as medicine too. And, you know, to help me with my, my own mental health issues related to anxiety and stress management. And so I know for me personally, you know, exercise is such a much more helpful outlet to go than things that I used to go to, which would be like smoking and and alcohol, you know? So for me, if I have that workout in at a time in the day when I would normally crave these things, then I don't crave them anymore. And that's really an amazing thing. So, you know, always keep in mind the why. Why am I exercising? I'm doing it. It'll make me feel better in the end. I just need to take one step towards, you know, towards the door, towards the... It can be just a simple walk around the park, walk around the block. It doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to be, you know, difficult. Have you found any forms of exercise in your research to be the most beneficial when somebody is like in that fight or flight? Because I know you you talk a lot and a lot of people talk about like logic when it comes to exercise. Like, Like I said, we all know that exercise is good for us. I think if we're like completely calm in a conscious state, our prefrontal cortex isn't all jacked up. We know that exercise is good for us. But the problem is when that becomes like hyper right? It takes away our ability to think logically. And we, we think more emotionally. If I understand this correctly, feel yeah. free to correct no, me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. How does somebody like in that state, like what is some of the best things somebody can do when they're feeling so hyper and overwhelmed and not able to think clearly? Yeah. So this happened to me at the very start. Of, I mean, it's happened before, but I have this clear memory at the start of the pandemic when, you know, the life was sort of collapsing and the intensity of the stress of the situation made it so that I couldn't work out intensely. And the reason why is because we have one stress system for all stressors. So that be it psychological stress in our life, but also physical stress from exercise. And so When we're in calm states, like you said, we can push it and it feels good. But when we already have a baseline level of stress in our body, we can't push it as much because we can't tolerate that much stress. So it's like layering stress upon stress upon stress and and it can lead to a panic attack. And so when you're feeling that level of stress, the best thing to do is ease off on the intensity. I have a workout in my book called The Fear Buster, and basically what this does is it, you know, it's like a brisk walk, and that brisk walk is going to build the resiliency factor neuropeptide Y. And then right at the end of the brisk walk, you sort of you get your mind in the right mindset you know, okay, I can do this. My body's activated. I'm going to, you know, push it. Then you sprint and it can just be like a short sprint. It can be 10 seconds. And the idea is that this exposes you to 
heart racing, difficulty breathing, but in this very safe and controlled space, right? Like it's exercise. You choose when to start. You choose when to stop. You choose how intense it's going to be. And this it essentially acts like a form of exposure therapy for people who are maybe afraid of those feelings of of heart racing, difficulty breathing, either because they have this anxiety sensitivity where they're, they fear those symptoms and it makes it difficult for them to engage in vigorous exercise. So this is like a nice baby step into not just building your fitness, but also building, building your tolerance to exercise more intensely. And in the in the long run, it helps reduce anxiety and stress. I'm really glad you brought up that we have this like one system for our stress response, right? And doesn't matter like if it's good stress, doesn't matter if it's bad stress, it all seems to get like woven into that. And while some of these things that are good stress, whether it be working out, whether it be uh, doing something that we're afraid of, whether it be, you know, traveling to go see some friends, whatever it is, are going to pay off more in the long term. It's still stress, right? And you don't want to throw yourself into this this state of panic by doing so when doing that. And yeah, the level, the exposure therapy that comes from just gradually pushing yourself in the gym is, is something that I think helps a lot of people with their anxiety. I mean, it helped, it's tre- it helped me tremendously and, and other people that I know. I want to talk about like the time of day with exercise because there's a lot of, there's been a lot of talk. I mean, probably over the last 10 to 15 years that you should exercise first thing in the morning. And like, that's the time to do it. Then I've heard other people say that now it doesn't work for them. Like they find that it's best for them, like in the afternoon or in the evening. So talk about like whether if you could talk about like whether it matters, like the time of day um, that you exercise and if you're if you get different benefits based on that. Yeah. So, yeah, I've heard that, too. So, OK, so working out first thing is sometimes easier because you have your full willpower. So, you know, we sleep, we wake up, we're fully charged, right? And so you have all the willpower you need to just exercise. It's not like the stress of the day gets in the way. Okay, but, you know, for people who aren't morning people like me, <laughs> like we're, the thought of working out right first thing in the morning is not pleasant. <laughs> and so the bottom line for that is that, you know, it's best to get it in whenever feels good for you. Some people like working out at night and that's just fine too. So when it comes to timing, timing exercise, it's, the impact is biggest for sleep. And that's because exercise can act to reset our brain time, our brain's biological clock. And so if you're finding yourself wanting to stay up a bit later, it's better to work out in the evening. If you're trying to get up earlier, it's better to work out in the morning or early afternoon. And essentially this helps reset your clock. So sometimes, you know, our biological clock can be just totally out of whack. And so that consistent timing of exercise helps to helps to realign time so that it's easier for us to sleep at night, we sleep deeper. And so yeah, that's the timing piece. Now, some people may think, oh, well, exercising before bed is it's going to disrupt my sleep. That's actually not true unless you're working out really intensely and your heart rate remains elevated when you're trying to go to bed. And so if you want to go for a brisk walk or a, a cycle or do a lift, as long as your your heart rate comes back down to baseline before bed, then it's just going to help improve your sleep, help you sleep deeper. A really interesting finding is that, you know, especially for alcohol, a lot of people will turn to alcohol to help them sleep because it's a sedative. And the research is quite interesting on this because a drink actually like can help you sleep deeper in the first part of the night. But in the second part of the night, it really disrupts it. And that's when we have our REM sleep, which is our vivid dream sleep. And this form of sleep seems to be really important for contextualizing our emotional memories so that we're not haunted by the emotional memories of the past. It puts it into context. And this is something that a lot of people struggle with, you know, this past regret. And so that REM sleep becomes really critical. And and so instead of having the, the nightcap opt for a walk or some other form of exercise before bed. Yeah, I think you you brought up something that I, a lot of people have 
either debated or just contemplated, which is like, can I get some sort sort of movement in before I go to bed to maybe decompress or, you know, relieve some stress. And I think there's a lot of nuance, right? In the answer, like you said, based on a few things, based on how intense the exercise is, like which we're going to get into next, because I think that's an, it's a, it's often something that is looked over in the world of exercise we're in today, where people are just jumping from workout program to workout program. And they're not looking at the rate of perceived exertion and, and how much they're actually like pushing themselves. And then B, I think it depends on like whether you're going to bed. Like I don't think it's ideal for somebody who is going to get up at 5 a.m. to work out at, at 9 p.m. before they go to bed at 10 or 11, right? Because they're just going to be constantly playing catch up with with sleep and repair that's probably not going to happen if they're only getting four to five hours of good quality sleep. But for the person that's going to work a bit later and they're going to bed a bit later, then yeah, that can definitely fit into the plan. And, and the opposite, I think, is also true. You talk a lot about like finding the sweet spot for exercise intensity, where if your rate of perceived exertion is not enough, then it doesn't get those benefits, those resiliency benefits that you've talked about. And then if you do it too hard, then it can somehow overwork your system. And, you know, there's some negative side effects that come with that. So talk about how the average person who's listening to this can find their sweet spot when they're exercising. Yeah, it's really simple. So there's this tool called the talk test. And I mean, it's as simple as it sounds. So basically, you go for your workout. And if you can talk comfortably, you're likely below this, you know, this sweet spot. But once it starts to become difficult to have a conversation with somebody, that's where you're at your sweet spot. And you really want to be around there. Like you said, if you're working out below that, you're not giving your body enough of a challenge it needs to adapt and grow stronger. And that's the key. That's what we want, right? If you push it too hard and you go way above that sweet spot, what happens is that it starts to damage the body and actually break it down. It makes you weaker, which is certainly what we don't want. And so you want to be right in the middle, like that Goldilocks little spot right there where it's comfortably challenging. And so this talk test when it starts to become difficult for you to have a conversation, that's the key. You know, that's where you are. And you might feel sort of a burning sensation in your muscles. And that's typically associated with lactate and seen as a bad thing. But this really vilified, you know, molecule of lactic acid or lactate actually turns out to be a hero when it comes to brain health because it, it moves from the muscles through the bloodstream directly to the brain, it reports to this the hippocampus, which is the memory center in the brain, and it starts stimulating growth so that we can form better memories, more vivid memories. And this helps, you know, keep our brain healthy as we especially as we get older. Yeah, I mean it's it, I think it's really important to pay attention to how hard we are working during a, a workout. And I have this conversation with clients of mine all the time that like you really have to know, like if if you're able to, it's like if you're able to have a, a really full on conversation, then you're not working hard enough, right? Mm -hmm. Is that is that correct? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So right now, you and I, we're not working hard enough. <laughs> but it's like if you can have like a kind of a like kind of half like half of a conversation, I guess if you will, with a combination of breathing hard and you're exerting, then I think you're at that right level, right? Yeah, that's right. So like we could get out a few words but it would be more difficult to have a full on sentence long conversation like this, you know? So yeah, you're able to, to say a few things, but not, not the full conversation. Yeah, exactly. And I think like, as we get older, this is an, it's an important thing to pay attention to even more because things are going to change. Our body adapts, things happen physiologically that I think we need to pay, pay attention to how our body's responding to certain forms of exercise. I'm a big proponent of like having a balanced workout routine. Like obviously I'm, I'm very big into resistance training myself, but I also include some cart, some cardiovascular exercise in, into my program along with a couple other things. But I would say for the average person, they don't have the time to spend the time I spend and the gym. I mean, because I'm a trainer and that's kind of like my job, if you will. So if you had to pick say like one form of exercise or one 
type of routine for somebody that just had 30 minutes a few times a week to exercise? Like, how would they program that? If they had 30 minutes three times a week, you know, it could be a brisk walk if they didn't have access to a gym. It could be what I like to call an interval walk where you walk and then you pick up the pace or you do you do some hit workouts on a hill. So you're, you're walking up a hill and you're walking down or you're running up a hill depending on what your fitness level is. Or you're going to the gym, you know, maybe, maybe you want to go to the gym and you want to lift weights and the stronger your body gets, the easier it is for you to move throughout the day. And so you'll likely find yourself moving more and overall, all of that activity adds up. And so I don't think we, we want to underestimate the value of short bursts of movement. And so if we're sitting all day, for example, uh, what happens is blood flow to the brain decreases. And this makes us like, it's difficult to concentrate. It's difficult to focus our minds wandering. And so to prevent this, the research suggests that every 30 minutes, you should just get up and do a movement break. And that doesn't have to be an intensive X. It could be jumping jacks. It could be push-ups. It could be burpees, but it could also be just, you know, stretching <laughs> or, you know, doing a little dance or whatever, whatever feels right for you just to stand up and get the blood flowing. This is enough. And so for people who don't have time, you do have time for a two minute movement break. Maybe make your, you know, your, your zoom meetings or your meetings a little bit shorter so that you have that extra little bit of time, like two minutes to five minutes. You don't even have to put on workout clothes for that. But otherwise, I mean, then it becomes amazing that once you have a routine, once you have this love and enjoyment for movement, then you just make it a priority. Like, like you, I mean, I spend some time every day moving in, in a very, you know, meaningful way, because for me, it's my medicine. And so I need to move every day. And I think that that's a really important thing for people to hear is that it doesn't have to be like one single bout of exercise, which in an ideal world, like, yeah, because then you would just get it all done and you wouldn't have to think about it. And you can kind of almost check the box, if you will. But not everybody necessarily lives in that same ideal world that we like to think about sometimes in, in the health uh, profession. And I think if people could just set an alarm and just say, okay, like for this first five minute break, we're going to do push ups and maybe some planks and bridges and stuff like that. And then the second five minute break, I'm going to go for a brisk walk. And the third five minute break, I'm going to stretch. And then, like, before you know it, you've got 15 minutes of like pretty solid movement in, right? Throughout the day. And that's going to. It adds up. Yeah. Yeah. Of reinforcing yeah. that habit of, mm -hmm. of taking care of yourself every day. That's where I want to go next is we talked about at the beginning, I opened with like, like why is exercise so hard to get into despite the, the massive benefits that we're all well aware of. The next layer of that is adhering and sticking to the program, right? Because there's people that are afraid of starting this um, New Year's resolution and just never get started. But then there's the people that start and then by March, by this time of year, they're done because it becomes hard to adhere to. So talk about like maybe some tips or best practices you have for people to stick to something long term and then maybe like some ways that they can, when they get started, they don't bite off more than they can chew, if you will. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it has to be a gradual process of of patience and that's difficult, <laughs> you know, when you're like, I'm ready <laughs> <Yeah>. to go. <laughs> Let's get fit. Let's get healthy. You want results right away. And so if your goal happens to be around, you know, improving your cardiovascular health or like losing weight, for example, that can take a long time. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. And so part of the shift is like is shifting our perspective you know because we can we can get the mental benefits from exercise immediately they happen immediately after exercise and so shifting the focus to being like i'm working out for stress relief for anxiety relief for to feel good and that happens immediately and you get that that feedback right away so i like to think that's probably number 1 the second thing is when we start working out, we typically have a goal in mind, right? Like lose weight, you know, get fit, you know, feel good, reduce stress. But when we're working out, it's important to not focus too much on that goal because the goal is external to us. You know, it's like a, 
it's an extrinsic motivator. But when we're working out, we need to be intrinsically motivated. We need to pay attention to the experience. And what do I mean by that? Like paying attention to your breath, paying attention to your the squeezing of your muscles, you know, the the uh, the effort, paying attention to your body. And the, this helps to stimulate like a flow like experience you know so where you're you're challenging yourself but it's doable and it feels so good because you're 100% in the moment and that's a, i think that's an important thing that people overlook and there's some there's some really interesting evidence so two people could be working out one who focuses on the goal one who focuses on the experience the person who focuses on the goal stop short. You know, they don't work out as long as the one who's focusing on the experience. And it doesn't have to be like an overly positive, you know, thing that you're focused. It can just be something simple like your breath or your, your body moving in space or your, the bulge of your muscle that you're feeling that feels so good. And so the experience of flow is, is a pretty incredible experience. It's, I would say on par with like runner's high. And, um, by paying attention to the experience, you can sort of, you can jump yourself into that flow like state, which is, it's pretty special. There's so much value in focusing on what you can control, right? Mm -hmm. You can control for the most part, I would say like how many times a week you go to the gym, you can control what you eat, you can control what type of exercise you do, you can control how hard you push yourself on that given day. You can't control always like how the scale is going to move. You can't control always like how fast you're going to build muscle. You can't control always like how fast you're going to see results. And I think you're right because there's so many people that that quit not because of how they're feeling about themselves internally with exercise. It's more because they haven't achieved the thing externally. They haven't lost the weight. They haven't gone down a size or whatever, but they, over, and they overlook the fact that like, gosh, I'm adhering to something for the first time in 15 years, or I'm actually, my relationships are much better. My I'm sleeping better. And I'm so glad that you touched on this. Cause this is something that I talk about a lot too with, with my clients is really focusing on the things you can control and using other metrics besides the scale to dictate what success looks like. And one of those we've talked about obviously is the mental benefits, mental health benefits. And we live in a world now where let's just like people, I just think that people aren't as happy, let's just say, as they used to be, right? You know, whether it's between what's happened in the la over the last few years. It's a or hard time. <laughs> <laughs> just like other life experiences that have shifted their outlook on life. And I was always taught when I was growing up that like mental health and physical health go hand in hand. I never believed it until I experienced it. But talk about why that's true. Like talk about from a mental health, like an optimistic point of view, like why it's so crucial to take care of your physical health to see those kind of benefits. Yeah. So you touched on a lot of important points there. So when we think about stress, yeah, stress is, it's part of our life, right? And now it seems really stressful, like we're coming off of a pandemic, into a war, into, you know, on top of all of our regular stress in our day. And even if it's not happening to us personally, like the the negative news is can be stressful, you know? And so what happens is we react to that stress. And if we react in sort of an intense way, like we get angry or upset or this reaction, this, this sort of change in our mood, this moodiness can start to break down the body. And it, it, it triggers an inflammatory response in the body, similar to as if you were like, you know, sick or, you know, had a disease that was causing, compromising your immune system. So our reaction to chronic stress causes inflammation in the body, which then causes inflammation in the brain and can lead to symptoms of depression and anxiety. And unfortunately, when anxiety and depression are caused by this pathway, sometimes they can't be treated by standard medication like antidepressants. Individuals with high levels of inflammation often respond best to exercise, not the antidepressant drugs. And so exercise is so beneficial for, for not only helping to reduce inflammation in the body. So 
I mean, a, an acute bout of exercise will temporarily increase it, but then it sends in this anti-inflammatory cleanup crew that gets rid of it all and then some. And so over time, your body is less inflamed. The other amazing thing that exercise does is it helps to make us less reactive to these everyday stressors. And so we're more calm. You know, stress is happening, but it's not affecting us in the same way. So what do you think is like at the root of that, of us not being nearly as affected by the stresses around us. Cause I always, I mean, I know this to be true, but I also have a, like when somebody asks me, I try to always relate it back to like, Oh, it's because you're stressing your body and you know, your, your, your body is working harder and adapting with like lifting more weight or running faster or whatever. So it's just going to get used to handling other stressors in life. But I don't know if there's science to back my approach up. I'm just thinking of it as my own, from my own experience, like from a scientific perspective, like why do you believe that when we exercise, it really assists us in handling other life stress, other life stressors? I mean, your, your intuition on this is spot on. When we challenge our stress system with exercise, it adapts and grows And because, like I said, we only have one stress system for all stressors, that translates into us being able to tolerate stress in our life better. And so there's a direct link, and it's related to building the strength of our autonomic nervous system. So there's two branches of the autonomic nervous system, the, the sympathetic, which is the fight or flight, and the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest. And by exercising, we help really strengthen that parasympathetic nervous system so that it can bring us back down to rest and recovery faster. And exercise helps to strengthen its power so that not just during an exercise session do we recover faster, which you've probably experienced, you know, the more consistently that you train the easier and faster you recover. But the same is true for stressors in our life. It's kind of like you have to work these non-physical muscles in life. And I think exercise indirectly helps you do that. It helps you work that faith muscle because you have to believe that you're going to lift the weight. You have to believe that you're going to be able to finish the class or whatever. It works the resilience muscle as we've, we've talked about. It works the discipline muscle. It works the consistency muscle. Like All these things that are just crucial for life. It doesn't matter like what you're going through. It doesn't matter if your life is good. It doesn't matter if your life is bad. Like You have to stay disciplined. You have to keep believing in yourself and you have to keep continuing to push yourself. It grows your resiliency. It grows your willpower. It grows your self-regulation. And not only do you, you know, exercise takes so much resiliency to stick to, but it gives it all back and then some, and it makes you stronger, not just physically, but mentally too. It's just so awesome. Yeah. It's a, it's a great catalyst for change in so many other areas of your life. And I could spend days talking to you about this because this is something that, that really like lights me up. And it's something that I'm passionate about for many reasons. And Jennifer, I just wanted to thank you so much for your time and for coming on. This has been an, an amazing conversation. I think a lot of people, people are going to get a lot out of. So if people want to connect with you more, they want to buy your book. It's called Move the Body, Heal the Mind. Where can they do that? So it's available anywhere books are sold. If you want, you can check out uh, my story, my personal story uh, at jenniferheiss.com. So that's Jennifer, H-E-I-S-Z.com. And you can look at my research uh, website too. It's neurofitlab.ca. So yeah, I hope you check it out. There's so much important information in there that we didn't get to talk about here. But yeah, with some really practical how-to tips to incorporate it, exercise into your life. Awesome. Well, I encourage people to go check out Jennifer's work and buy the book because there is a lot of interesting information in there. And I wanted to go a deeper dive into the mental health, the addiction uh, mindset benefits of exercise because I, I I like it's something that I think is is so important because you can have in my experience you can have all the the tools and all the the next tips and tricks in the world but if you don't like master that part of it um, I think it makes it much more challenging so for those listening what I invite you to do just like I try to with every episode is to share a takeaway maybe it was something that Jennifer said on how exercise helps with recovery from addiction maybe it was something 
she said about adhering to a program. Maybe it was something that she said uh, with regards to timing in the the time of day to exercise, whatever it was, uh, make sure to tag Jennifer, tag myself, because we'd love to hear your feedback. And we once again, thank you for listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bopes, and we'll see you next time.